um, we hope that you might find time before you leave to explore our first floor exhibits. Um, and our deep and rich connection with Route 66 and Abraham Lincoln. Um, a few logistical things. We are without heat right now, and we apologize for that. It should stay warm enough, but it'll be a little cool. This building was built in 1903. It is the fourth courthouse of McLean County. This footprint in the second courthouse on the same square is where Abraham Lincoln practiced law. He spoke many times in and around the square, so you are in historic space. Buildings across the street are still um, there from the 1800s where Lincoln actually practiced law with colleagues. So there's a lot of history here around the square. Um, staff have museum badges, so if you have questions, um, seek us out. And one final thing, restrooms. There are one, women's and men's, same entrance, first floor by the registration desk. There are no other public restrooms anywhere else in the building, so please be aware of that. And we're thrilled to have you. And I'm going to turn it over to Joy. So you talk, I talk about the war. Thank you. No, no, this is here. This is still. Well, just a quick welcome from me. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Joy Quartero Austin. I'm a senior program officer uh, for economic vitality at Main Street America. Um, and I was the f uh, former now Illinois Main Street director. But I wanted to say hello um, and just kind of give you a little bit of an update. I know that some of you may know that Illinois Main Street in general has sort of had its ebbs and flows. But I just wanted to say that we're really coming back stronger than ever. Um, so just thank you very much for you all being here. I know some of you I saw last year also at the conference in Jacksonville. Um, we have our renewed partner with the uh, Lieutenant Governor's Office. Uh, we were able to secure some funding through DCEO to provide up to $30,000 for our participating communities in the Illinois Main Street program. Uh, we were able to hire uh, a new program manager for our state, Jim Miller, who's downstairs. He was welcoming you all, so yes. Let's applaud that. That was, that is, thank you, Dion. <laughs> Um, and then finally, of course, our, our partnership um, also with um, Main Street America. Um, you know, we're very excited to have staff here from Main Street America. If you all could stand up, I see a couple of you in the back, Gustavo and Lisa. And then I will introduce also Dion. So, our Main Street America staff will be um, uh, hosting their courses at the hangar. So if you were here yesterday, uh, you can go there, uh, meet with them, also uh, speak with them about sort of the fundamentals of our Main Street approach. Um, oh, and I forgot to mention, we also were able to welcome three new communities and are working with several others to come into the program. So, thank you. Um, and really with that, I would actually like to introduce our Vice President of Neighborhood Services, Ms. Deanne Bow. Thank you, thank you, Joy. Uh, so Illinois is on a move and coming back, right? I'm so happy to see all of you here today in this beautiful historic space. Um, as Joy mentioned, I am Dion Bow, Vice President of Neighborhood Services, Urban Development. We're not quite sure what my title is, <laughs> but no, our work really focuses on working with our big city programs, and we have several of our big city programs rec represented from Chicago today. So I'm so happy that they're here too. Um, today I'm here to introduce Mayor Buka. Um, Mayor Buka was first appointed to the City Council in March of 2011 to serve out the term of the previous City Council member for Ward, Ward 3. Mambuka was then elected to the position, um, I'm sorry, to the position on April 9th, 2013 after a successful campaign. Mayor Buka was elected as mayor on April 6, 2021. Yeah. Mayor Buka was born in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the youngest of seven children, in 1977, Mirbuka family moved to the Ivory Coast in Africa, where his father became an official for, for UNICEF, a specialized United Nations agency focused on improving the lives of children and mothers in developing countries. In 1983, Mirbuka's family moved to Senegal, following, <clears throat> followed by another move in 1988 back to the Republic of Congo. It is through those experiences that Mayor Buka began to appreciate the differences in all human beings and value what those differences can bring to the table. 
So remember, we're not focusing on sameness here, but how can diversity really bring us all together and hear those diverse perspectives? Mirbuka graduated from high school in 1989 and landed in New York to pursue a college education. He enrolled at Illinois State University in 1990, where he graduated with a bachelor's degree in mathematics, so he's good with his numbers, in 1994. The right? <laughs> you know your ABCs and your one, two, threes. <laughs> that fall, Mayor Buka enrolled in the Graduate School of Education at Illinois State University. Mayor Buka and his wife, Stacy, are the parents of four beautiful children who keep them hopping with many activities. Maya, Mirama, Amelie, and Jonah, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced their names. Mirbuka has been employed at Illinois State University since 1997 and absolutely loves the city of Bloomington. Mirbuka is fluent in three other languages, French, Swahili, and Lingala, and also learned Spanish in high school. Please help me in welcoming Mirbuka to the stage. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Dion, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, the only thing that I didn't like about it is, you know, reminding me of when I graduated in high school. <laughs> 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 but it, it was great. Thank you very much. Today is a really crazy, interesting day. I've been running around already, for, you know, from, you know, I woke up this morning at 7.30, but promise I took a shower. <laughs> But, you know, it was kind of a busy day uh, last night with my son, you know, running around to Juliet for soccer and everything and back and, you know, getting ready for this morning. So uh, I'm, I'm glad I made it here in, in one piece, uh, you know, even with this cold weather. Um, so it's my pleasure to, to welcome all of you to, to Bloomington and to, to have an opportunity to showcase our downtown and, and our community as well. Uh, many would say that I'm, I'm biased, um, but you know, there's clearly a palpable excitement uh, about our downtown. Um, if you don't believe me, you can ask those of us who were here uh, yesterday. Um, you know, at 4 p.m. to witness a, a large crowd standing in front of Red Raccoon Game Store on, on Main Street, <laughs> uh, just uh, north of us, I think, in that direction. Uh, and I was telling uh, yesterday the CEO of the EDC, uh, Patrick Hoban, you know, who was standing next to me, that the, the only time that I've seen crowds this enthusiastic uh, is in such frigid weather uh, temperatures is either on Black Friday at 2 a.m., you know, at Best Buy, <laughs> or at, the, at a Green Bay Packer game in January, you know. Um, but as funny as it may seem, that I, I thought that visual was the perfect symbol uh, of what is happening in, in downtown Bloomington. Uh, like I said, the, the, the excitement is palpable. You can feel it. You can smell it. You know, you can even taste it, you know, sometimes. After years of struggles, uh, focus groups, <laughs> plans, <laughs> council meetings, sometimes violent disagreements, no, only intellectual, not violent. <laughs> um, I believe that the conditions are really now ideal for our downtown to be revitalized. Uh, in fact, being out down in, around our downtown, you know, day in and day out, uh, it's becoming more and more evident that we're moving beyond revitalization and we are thriving uh, despite the impact of COVID, you know, over the past three years. And I, I can attribute that to three particular elements. Uh, one, we know that the, the, the growth in popularity of shopping malls has resulted in trouble for many of our downtowns, you know, in, in the past. Uh, and in order to reverse that trend here locally, I think we, we needed uh, business growth and or, you know, a population. I mean, you can't get around it. You know, you need more people uh, in your city in order to be able to, to revitalize some of your uh, uh, you know, struggling areas. And with the arrival of newcomers like, uh, you know, Rivian, Ferrero, and, and Brandt, I know people get us, you know, get tired of us saying that, but we're going to keep saying it because we're happy, we're excited about it. 
uh, you know, and, and with the addition also, uh, there's also growth that we've seen from traditional local powerhouses like uh, State Farm and, and Country uh, Financial and many others. So we, we've gotten the economic boost that our downtown solely needed, and that's why I believe we're, we're thriving. Um, we, the other thing that I would say that's, you know, really has gotten us to where we are today is that we, we do have a, a fantastic staff, uh, you know, in our economic development area that is hard at work uh, nurturing our downtown with their creativity and also flawless execution on projects, events, and, and partnerships with local organizations like uh, the Mid-Illini, uh, Mid-Illinois uh, Realtors Association. My daughter's an Illini, that's why I said Illini. <laughs> uh, they, I don't know if you've noticed the Route 66 parklet um, outside, uh, right by uh, uh, Red Raccoon Games, actually. So you should, you know, I know it's really cool, but take an opportunity to go take a picture, you know, out there. If not, come back in the summer, take a picture, and spend your hard-earned dollars in downtown Bloomington. <laughs> um, so I, I want to take a moment to, to recognize the, the staff that does a fantastic work. I know they don't do it alone, you know, they, they work with a number of different people, but they're here, so they're the stars of the day. So if you could please stand so we can, uh, yeah, and they're looking at me like, oh, I don't want to stand. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, no, 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 no. This is the part where we embarrass everybody, so we want Melissa to stand. And also Kimberly, <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> and this is, they're very much behind the scenes kind of people, as you can see, they don't like the attention, but they, they do fantastic work uh, for us. Just in the past three years, just think about it, they, we've had 229 events you know, in our downtown, which is amazing, okay? And a lot of times, you know, even if it is uh, a, a, a private, you know, concern that decides to, to have the event, but it, it takes the staff to kind of make it all work together. So I, we, we definitely appreciate the work that, they, that they've done. Uh, in those 229 events, you know, we, we've had uh, more than 500,000 people uh, visit the downtown as, as a result. Um, and, and, and of course, that also means a, a lot of tax revenue. Uh, I've been told about $4.6 million in the past three years. So this is tax revenue that we can use to, uh, to do more programs downtown and, and, and provide more services for our residents. Um, the other thing, uh, you know, just as important is that we, we do have uh, local policymakers who are committed uh, to the downtown and, and providing resource, the resources necessary to affect change. They know that we will fall behind if we're complacent. And complacency is definitely not part of the Bloomington City Council's uh, vocabulary. I mean, in the past year, we've accomplished more than I've seen, you know, in, in, in the past, uh, you know, if, if I say, it, it's just amazing. You know, we, we've renovated the, uh, we're in the process of renovating the library. We, we are uh, building not a pool, but an aquatic park. <laughs> Uh, in uh, on on the west side, uh, and and there is a lot more uh, to to come with that. Uh, they're a very determined group, and that's why just a couple of months ago, uh, we approved a downtown streetscape uh, project. Um, and if it hadn't passed, I probably wouldn't have been accepted the invitation to be here. <laughs> you know, so it's kind of ironic that just a couple of months ago, you know, we passed this thing, and here we are uh, having, uh, you know, this uh, this conference. I, somebody must have had a crystal ball. You know, I don't know when did we uh, put in for this uh, conference, Melissa? Do you know? April. Okay, so that wasn't even in the books. You know, we we didn't. You know, we had this. Uh, uh, the streetscape plan, uh, you know, on the city council agenda, I believe in August, right? <laughs> yes, yes, in August. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, fate, destiny, you know, so th this is very exciting. And so speaking of, you know, these, uh, you know, policy makers, I, I know we have a couple of them here. I'm going to embarrass them as well. Uh, Tom Crumpler, who's our alderman for Ward 9.
And we also have Donna Bolin, all the women for War II. Okay. These are really fantastic people to work with. You know, we, we don't always agree on everything, but that's the beauty of it though, is that they, whatever they provide, whatever feedback helps us come, you know, get discernment about the decisions that we're going to make, and we get to the right decision always. Uh, I, I believe that. So thank you both for your service and your, your commitment to the city of Bloomington. Really appreciate that. Um, this plan uh, and the many economic and, and even quality of life related items that I've mentioned uh, earlier um, are examples of the, the synergy that, that exists, uh, that is evident between the policymakers, uh, the business community, our local uh, economic development team, uh, also the EDC, I mentioned Pat Patrick Hoban uh, earlier, but also taxpayers. Um, and as a result, you know, we envision that the downtown streetscape project will result in significant public and private investments uh, that will transform our, our downtown into a beautiful, uh, if it's not, it's already beautiful, but an even more beautiful uh, regional destination with modern infrastructure that will foster growth, uh, not only in the downtown, but also on its outskirts. Uh, I cannot wait for us to get going uh, on, on this project. I, I believe uh, the, uh, the, the the plans will, will come together uh, within the next uh, nine or 10 months because it's been a couple months uh, uh, already. Um, and I can't wait to show everyone the, the Bloomington of the future. Uh, you know, this is going to include, uh, you know, a new transfer station, uh, bioswales, uh, ADA improvements, uh, lighting, uh, public gathering space, uh, EV chargers and, and you know, gateways um, that we are going to, to, to put together. Uh, in, in fact, uh, I, I made a pitch to Joy yesterday to when I met her uh, to, to have the conference in Bloomington every year from now on. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a couple council members here so we can work on a resolution. <laughs> you know, with lots of whereas. You guys love resolutions, you know, whereas and whereas and whereas. Yes, we, let's, we can do that. Um, but of course, you know, as the team player that Joy is, you know, she said, no, 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 we can't do that every year. We have to spread the well, so we're gonna have to do it in, in other communities as well. Um, so I, I, I definitely, I, I understand that. But either way, I, I you know, until then, I, I hope you enjoy the next couple of days uh, here in, in Bloomington uh, and that you avail yourself of everything that Bloomington has to offer. It, it's really fantastic to have you all here. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Mayor. We really appreciate being in your beautiful town. And I think, you know, Bloomington is definitely on the move and the mayor has, has told us several examples of how they're not complacent. I think this is a wonderful transition to our speakers today about not being complacent and about not waiting and constantly pushing for change. 26 years ago, the Puerto Rican flag was installed on a division in Mozart Avenue community in Humble Park 26 years ago, right? Today, we're here to talk about the cultural district that this community has fought for to make certain that we are recognizing Puerto Rico town for what it is and all of its cultural relevance in the Chicago community. <clears throat> so, the session that you're gonna hear is leveraging policy and creating cultural districts to drive economic success. Jose Lopez, who I'm so honored to introduce, you don't know how much of a fan of yours I am, but I am, <laughs> has written extensively on a political and social reality of Puerto Ricans in the United States while serving as executive director of the Puerto Rican Cultural Center in a humble park community in Chicago which he co-founded in 1973. He is also an adjunct instructor at Northeastern Uni uh, Illinois University, Columbia College, and the University of Illinois at Chicago. In his role as educator, activist, he has been invited to speak at over 50 colleges and universities in, uni in the United States, Mexico, Canada, and Puerto Rico. 
as well as in international forums, such as the United Nations Decolonization Committee. For over 40 years, and I keep talking with the mask, I'm sorry, I hope you can hear me. For over 40 years, he has been a leading member of the Puerto Rican independence movement, and is also the editor of the Puerto Rican nationalism, a reader. Presently, he is active in developing new theories in community and social empowerment, particularly in the areas of educational reform through the community as a campus initiative and addressing health inequities through the building of a holistic community of wellness in Chicago's Greater Humboldt Park community. He has served on various boards, including Bethany Advocate Fund and the Chicago Public Schools Latino Advisory Committee. I'm also pleased to introduce my new friend, Dr. Senator Christina Passone Zayas. She served on the Illinois Learning Lear Early Learning Council Executive Committee, Illinois State Team of the BUILD Initiative, and the Title V Needs Assessment Advisory Committee for the state's federally mandated maternal and child, and child health services. Her service in Chicago Public Schools and in Lance, and in Lasse, Chicago built a track record for leveraging community partnerships. And if you don't, guys don't know where in Lasse, Chicago is, that's in a little village neighborhood of Chicago. Implementing restorative justice practices and supporting the leadership of young people, parents, and educators. Senator Pasaune Zayas has served on the Educational Success Committee for Governor J.B. Pritzker's transition team and the Education Committee of Mayor Lightfoot, Light, Lightfoot's transition team. Please join me in welcoming these two great presenters. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I, um, I am honored to be here. Um, let me just um, give a little bit of context to this idea of a cultural enterprise district. Um, this is an idea that was discussed, elaborated, sort of articulated in a summit that we held over five years ago in the Greater Humble Park community of Chicago, where we brought together about 300 uh, activists in housing, uh, housing organizations, as well as all of our elected officials from, um, the, mu from the municipal level to the county level, to the state, to the federal level. And um, we were concerned about two issues that I think are confronting urban America and even the world. And those two are the historical disinvestment in communities, obviously the inner city communities, and the problem that is being brought through the monetizing and the incredible um, challenges that gentrification poses for communities in those inner cities. So facing those two problems, we convened this summit and we brought as our keynote speaker an amazing African-American scholar, Dr. Mindy Thompson Fully Love. And I would hope that all of you would read her book, Root Shock. And her thesis is that the, obviously the body goes into shock when it is confronted with trauma to protect the vital organs. And her thesis is that the black community in terms of cultural production across the United States is in a state of root shock. Mm -hmm. So what is, is she talking about? Well, basically her assessment is that U.S. Um, urban policies, particularly through the urban renewal practices as well as gentrification, created the idea that the inner cities were blighted areas and all you needed to do was to obviously 
uh, bulldoze those areas and perhaps save some wonderful buildings from the 19th century that you would turn into and revive into mansions for a very high level income group of people. So we decided that um, from this, from her thesis, let, let me go a little bit deeper, and that is that her idea is that the greatest cultural production of African American people in the United States took place in the black metropolis. Everywhere, in Pittsburgh, in San Francisco, in Harlem, in Bronzeville, everywhere. That is being stymied. Why? Because when you bulldoze those areas, you're bulldozing entire communities. You are bulldozing an ecosystem. And what you destroy in the process is really irreplaceable. You're destroying churches. You're destroying community centers. You're destroying everything that gives life to a community where culture is created and reproduced and ultimately articulated as a whole. So we decided, taking her idea, that we needed to understand that culture is a basic element to all of our lives. So all of you have heard, obviously, the theory of Maslow of the hierarchy of needs. I take issue with that um, whole theory because the theory is based on the idea that you have to meet people's basic needs in order for them to engage in higher cultural engagement. Everything we do is culture. The food we eat, the housing we create, the clothes we wear, all over the world, all of those things talk about culture. So culture is everywhere. And it is the basis of every people. So given that idea, we have to think about what is gentrification? What is the problem that it poses to the future of the city itself? What kind of city are we talking about? Are we talking about a city of where there is a whole gamut of people who are excluded? Or are we talking about a city in which everyone is welcome? Every city in history has always served an elite. I don't care if you take ancient Rome or Athens or you take Tenochtitlan or you take any great city in the ancient times or we move to the medieval city. As a matter of fact, Venice and all those cities were cre where you created the ghetto because in St. Augustine's city of God, which informed the creation of the medieval city, Jews were not allowed and they were to live in ghettos. That's where we get the word ghetto from. And then we move into the industrial and the, mer the mercantile city and the industrial city and look at Liverpool and Manchester and the amazing um, housing and, and living conditions in the slums of those cities, particularly of the Irish and what in England were called the um, internal colonies of England. Now, we come to the information city. What kind of city are we looking at? And what should we be talking about? So I'm gonna suggest to you that part of this, this summit and hopefully part of the discussion we bring you is to reimagine the city as the world in the city. The world in the city. That you can travel in a city and experience the world. When you heard earlier about what's happening here in Bloomington, when I saw coming down the, um, the road there, cultural district, this is exactly what we should be celebrating. So that's the idea that we came up with. It's an idea that we obviously um, gave to our um, legislators and they took this idea and ran with it. And so for us, 
it's important that as we discuss today and later on in the deeper dive session, that we look at that idea of what kind of city do we want and think about, there's a wonderful quote from the Quran, the holy book of the Muslims. And it says, we have made you different so you can know each other. Imagine that it's in our differences that our humanity is premise. And if we understood that, then we can understand how important it is to create the world in the city. And by the way, 80% of the world's people by the end of this century will live in urban areas. And every city in the world is facing similar problems to that of Chicago, of New York. And obviously, when we look at this political messaging in Illinois about how horrible Chicago is, we could do the same thing with every city in the United States and in the world. I don't care what city you visit, you will find it. Why? Because we have marginalized populations that we do not include. They are the excludables. And no city should be informed by excludables. So I think that's um, a just... And I bet you guys didn't think you were going to get a history class <laughs> whenever you are with Dr. Lopez. He will take you across history. Um, I, you know, this, is, this plenary is meant to be a little bit of a teaser, right? We have a deep dive later this afternoon where we're going to get a lot more into specifics. Um, but we wanted to give some high level, right? You know, he just set the context for the why. Why do we need state designated cultural districts? And I'm here to kind of unpack a little bit further, what are they, right? And essentially, in the most generic fashion, it's a tool. It's a tool for community building. It's a tool for preservation and sustainability of a community. And it is utilizing culture, not as some ornate, anemic concept, but as an economic driver that is led by indigenous leadership in a community to ensure that there will be a community for the descendants while at the same time acknowledging the ancestors. And so when um, I got involved, I was the co-chair of the Puerto Rican Agenda. And anyone who has come to Chicago and spent some time in communities that are either Latino or African American, you're going to see some very extreme gentrification and aggressive gentrification that has displaced communities, deconcentrated our social and political power. And you know we can run all kinds of campaigns. We can um, create issue awareness. We can attempt to do some wealth building. But what we wanted to do was have a tool that's codified in state government so that communities can put it in their toolkit as they're thinking about development and also to present a very different way of approaching development, right? Not just development for the sake of economic activity, but it's development in the terms of progress, but progress not in a linear sense, but in a holistic and comprehensive sense that centers humans and the collective, right? It's not about profit, it really is about people. Um, and so in this process, uh, you know, totally was a part of the whole conceptualization and then um, had the opportunity to serve in the Senate. And you know, as one of my first pieces of legislation, we introduced this in the Senate, not knowing, and mind you, when I came into the Senate, it was smack dab in the middle of the pandemic. I was appointed in December 2020. Um, so I had a real clear mandate <laughs> of what I needed to be doing in the Senate. Um, because you know, in, in many instances, as extreme as it sounds, it's do or die. 
right? And, and I actually felt like it was a great opportunity to double down on the organic work that was happening in the community. And so we introduced this bill where the state would identify unique geographies with a historic or cultural identity um, as a state designated cultural district. The Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity would be the administering agency. There would be a competitive application process, um, but we set criteria so that we, we, we try to think about ways that this can be very deliberate in terms of um, countering gentrification, in terms of countering displacement, um, in terms of also considering the adverse impact of COVID on our, on our um, towns, on our communities, on our cities. Um, and so in it, when we set that criteria, we also wanted to make sure that communities were thinking about these designations in a holistic way. So it was not just about small businesses and the preservation or the incubation of small businesses, it was also about housing. How can we retain indigenous residents in the area? It was also about education. Is there a comprehensive education strategy that goes, that extends the school walls into the community and really thinks of a community as a campus of learning opportunities? We also wanted to look at transportation. How can we keep, how, how can we become less reliant on cars, on fuels, um, and, and have sort of a, a microcosm of different types of transportation um, within a community. We also were looking at food scarcity. Um, how can we become, um, you know, self-fulfilling um, in terms of like urban agriculture and being able to promote that? So the idea was that um, the communities that would be applying would be able to demonstrate that these kinds of plans were underway. No, we don't expect it to be fully baked, but we needed to have a sense that there was that type of vision, but also there's the buy-in, the participation of individuals that would ultimately benefit from this. So again, it can't just be a master developer coming in with a master plan. There really needed to be evidence that there had been deep community engagement and discussion in the development of this particular plan. And so I'll stop right there because um, I know we're coming up on the 45 minute mark, um, and, but like I said, it's meant to be a teaser. We're gonna go deep in the, in the afternoon, um, but I'll turn it back to Dr. Lopez because there's just the pillars piece so that you can kind of know in the context of Puerto Rico town, what are the kind of basic building blocks that we'll go deeper in in the afternoon? Thank you. Let's give her. A, she's, she's been a wonderful student all her life, but say I, I've known her forever, so. <laughs> um, and, and I think something that I, I think is important about the work that we do is that we have centered our work a lot around leadership development from an organic perspective. And so most of our elected officials are people that have grown and have developed within the context of the community. So um, let me just say that we have, um, on, on, in, in this plan, we propose four pillars. They're pretty much what most of you know uh, in terms of what we need in a good ecosystem in order for people to thrive and live well. Obviously, education. And for us, education means taking a critical perspective on what that means. And we'll, we'll discuss that in a, later on, what it would mean in terms of the various ideas, including an aligned curriculum around urban edge, a, agriculture. Um, throughout this area, which by the way, is a two mile long uh, designation from Division and Western to Division and Pulaski. So it would be a whole corridor, and that's the way we want you to imagine. And in um, the brochure we passed out, there's a little map that shows already some of the development that has taken place. The other obviously is, um, so with education, 
health and wellness because the idea of health for us is the entire, um, our, our entire situation. So it's health and wellness. The other one is obviously housing and particularly around affordable housing because that is the biggest threat we're, 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 we're looking at, but also housing that encourages different kinds of needs of communities in the entire uh, area. Um, the other, obviously, is um, the pillar of um, economic um, development. And for us, that is a really important part because without economic development, you have no wealth. But the idea is to be able to generate wealth. We've created a mercado, an incubator, and we have already, as of this year, li literally gotten five licenses, four of them to women in the community to open up their own businesses. So they went from an informal um, economic um, practice to a very formal economic practice. So, um, I think I've covered them right. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> so. I think the next time we'll see you, if you join us for the deep dive is 1.30. Um, and that, that will be, we'll have a lot of room for questions and answers because I think it's really good to get feedback. Um, but we'll go into the constructs of the actual legislation and then obviously the deeper plan for Puerto Rico Town as the model community for a state designated cultural district. <laughs>